Hello and welcome to Random Interesting Facts, the podcast about everything and nothing, with your host 42. This week's theme is sand. Let's begin by diving right into fact number one. Sandcastles are more dangerous than sharks. How on earth can a sandcastle attack you? Well, it doesn't. It turns out people tend to fall into the holes dug by sandcastles a lot. And unfortunately, more than two dozen young people have been killed over the last decade from sand asphyxiation, as far as we know. If you're in a hole on the beach, when the sand collapses in on you, it can happen horrifically fast. Victims are submerged in seconds. And it can leave virtually no evidence of the hole itself or the location of the victim. It's quite a horrifying thought, and naturally most people worry about shark attacks rather than killer sand. But there were only 12 fatal shark attacks in the USA from 1990 to 2006, compared with 16 sand hole or tunnel deaths. And researchers think that sand-related deaths are probably much higher in number because they're less well documented than shark attacks. Most suspected sand deaths were before the days of the internet. I mean, nowadays, of course, you can't even put a cat in a bin without it finding its way onto YouTube. Please don't put cats into bins, by the way. Overall, there have been 31 recreational sand hole deaths, that's what they're technically known as, since 1985 in the United States, United Kingdom, Australia and New Zealand. There were also 21 other incidents in which a person was rescued from the collapse and in most cases bystanders um, managed to resuscitate them through CPR. Which leads to the horrifying conclusion that If sand does collapse in on you, um, your chances of death are much higher than your chances of survival. I never remember seeing Pamela yanking an upside-down ten-year-old out of the sand on Baywatch, but maybe I was too distracted by all the, uh, jiggling. (whistles) Take the case in the summer of 1998 in Martha's Vineyard community of Edgartown, when a recreational sand hole collapsed, engulfing an eight-year-old girl. Luckily, in this instance, the girl survived, but only thanks to a dramatic split-second rescue. Following this incident, local lifeguards were ordered to instruct children and adults out of any hole deeper than a child's waist. Which seems a bit vague to me. I mean, how tall is this child? And then the lifeguard must uh, order the, uh, the sandcastle perpetrator to fill in their deadly hole. Which, no doubt, is frequently met with uh, the retort of an angered mum saying, You're ruining my little Timmy's day! Because, you know, mums, you know what they're like. Not even the Grim Reaper can get in the way of their child's happiness. Gosh, no. In May 2001, sadly, a 17-year-old high school student was at a beach party in Westerly, Rhode Island, and he fell backwards into an eight-foot-deep sand hole. The hole promptly caved in, and by the time help arrived, he'd been found buried alive for 15 minutes. Man-made sand castles can also be a really deadly threat to sea turtles, Every year, hundreds of thousands of hatchlings rise from their nests along the coast in places like Florida and Panama and scramble over the sands to enter the Atlantic Ocean. It's kind of like Black Friday, but instead of a new TV, they're fighting for survival. And unfortunately, approximately only one in 1,000 sea turtle hatchlings will survive to maturity, which is remarkably similar to Black Friday survival rates, now I come to think of it. It starts before they even hatch. As soon as the eggs are laid on the beach, 
They're at huge risk of predators roaming the beaches. And if they do make it to hatching, they just become a bite-sized snack for predators lurking about in the ocean, like birds, crabs, and our old friends, sharks. It's a hard, hard life for a sea turtle, and all that before they even discover what income tax is. And if all those natural threats are not enough to contend with, a sea turtle also has another man-made challenge. Sandcastles, of course, which are prevalent, at least they remain on most beaches in the world, and it's yet another obstacle they need to uh, overcome on the way to the shoreline. You see, a small hole in the sand is like crossing the Grand Canyon to a sea turtle. And sandcastles are like Mount Everest. I mean, Frodo had less trouble trying to get the ring to Mordor than hatchlings have getting to the shoreline. They're taking the sea turtles to Isengard. Florida-based sand artist Todd Brittingham clearly didn't give a shit about sand turtles because for International Earth Day, he created a giant Ouroboros, the symbol of a serpent eating its own tail, by digging really large trenches in the sand of Cocoa Beach. The design was only supposed to be there over the weekend, but by Monday morning, local residents were informing Florida Fish and Wildlife that the trenches had not been filled in. Now, isn't it ironic that he felt the need to celebrate Earth Day by threatening the existence of some poor sea creature? You see, even small trenches can capture all types of sea turtle hatchlings. And this art piece went against Cocoa Beach's municipal code to prohibit the digging of holes more than 18 inches deep. Not to mention going against my personal code, which forbids pretentious tits from calling their sandcastles art. Due to the fact that he pissed off and left this giant sea turtle precipice of death in the beach and didn't fill it in, Brittingham was fined by both Cocoa Beach and the state of Florida. And given the state of public liability these days, he was probably also forced to pay damages to one particularly pissed off sea turtle named Keith with a neck injury. Now let's take a break from Sun for a moment and dive into moments from history. Where we look at one particularly odd moment from the past. Did you know that Pepsi, yes, the drinks manufacturer, once had the world's sixth largest military? To understand why, we need to go back to the mid to late 1950s. A period when the USSR was beginning to peek out from behind their Iron Curtain. I don't know how you peek out from behind an Iron Curtain, it's probably quite stiff. Anyway, the USSR was opening up a bit more to America um, due to the slightly less angry communist leadership of one Nikita Khrushchev. So in 1959, then President Dwight Eisenhower decided to try and show Khrushchev that there's a nicer way to do things in communism and um, tried to introduce him to the American way. And so he invited him on an official state visit to the White House. Presumably Khrushchev was slightly annoyed that it wasn't called the Red House, but he came along anyway to see the the benefits and delights of a capitalist nation, and Dwight Eisenhower laid on a suitable capitalist spread. It was like a cultural exchange, if you will. The Americans were keen to show the Soviets what their way of life could offer, and vice versa. So, you know, the, the Russians could experience the delights of cheeseburgers, Hershey bars, and awful family sitcoms and you know american visitors to to russia might sample the delights of vodka and being brutally murdered in a gulag ah! so in the summer of 1959 eisenhower and khrushchev arranged something called the usa ussr exhibition 
one part of which would occur on a, in a grand exhibit situated in New York, and the other one in Moscow to exhibit all that the US had to offer in Russia. It sounds nice so far, it's certainly better than a nuclear showdown and the end of all humanity. But obviously not wanting to risk going to Moscow himself, Dwight sent over the then Vice President Richard Nixon over to Moscow to open up the US National Exhibition there that was to entice Russians with the delights of American culture. And it featured such classics as American fast food and drinks, cars, art, fashion, and an entire model American house. And that model American house may ring some bells with some of you because on the 24th of July, Vice President Richard Nixon showed Khrushchev around the exhibition and they ended up in the kitchen where something, where a famous scene happened called the kitchen debate. So whilst these two powerful um, world leaders, and well, one of them is a vice president, were standing in this life-size doll's house, they had a full-on tit-for-tat about the benefits of communism versus capitalism, and it subsequently became known as the kitchen debate. From my experience, kitchen debates are usually, why don't you ever wash the pissing dishes? But uh, this one was a bit more serious. Luckily, I, I presume there were no atomic bombs hiding in the bread bin. But to ease attention a little, Nixon then led Khrushchev over towards the Pepsi booth. There were booths for Disney, Pepsi, IBM, all your big American brands. So Nixon subtly eased Khrushchev over to the, the Pepsi booth, saying, why don't we cool down with a nice, refreshing Pepsi? Uh, and it seemed rather impromptu, um, but actually the, the entire situation had been preordained. You see, the Pepsi executive, Donald M. Kendall, was eager to knock on the, uh, the walls of the Iron Curtain and say, hey, Russians, you know, you, you don't have to go to work on a belly full of vodka in the mornings, which is, is something uh, Russians still do this to this day. They, uh, they stop on their way to work um, for a shot of vodka before operating heavy machinery, yeah. But anyway, Pepsi executive was desperate to break the uh, Russian market, so he discussed this the night before with Nixon at the American embassy and said, okay, I'm going to prepare two special batches of Pepsi. I'll make one with American water and the other using Russian water. And, you know, you can, you can bring over Khrushchev, the, you know, the the evil communist dictator and you can both sample each uh, each each drink and it'll be it'll be a big laugh you can see which tastes nicer you know and um act like it's all impromptu act like it wasn't planned but it was completely planned anyway the end goal was for nixon to get khrushchev to drink a bottle of pepsi and for a photo opportunity um great for pr and sure enough that's exactly what happened khrushchev ended up um sipping pepsi Luckily, Khrushchev did resist the urge to immediately spit it out and call it Western imperialist dog piss, because that wouldn't have been so successful for marketing. Although, funnily enough, Khrushchev's son did later remark that most Russians' first take on Pepsi was that it smelled suspiciously like shoe wax, which I have to admit isn't particularly an olfactory response that that. I've experienced when drinking Pepsi, but, um, you know, it, it, it made sure that uh, Russians remembered it at least, and sure enough, uh, the whole PR exercise was a triumph. Hooray! Okay, not an overnight triumph, it took six more years, but six years after the American National Exhibition, Kendall, who was now the CEO of Pepsi, succeeded in completely locking the main competitor, Coca-Cola, obviously, out of the USSR. And Pepsi became the first capitalistic product available in the Soviet Union. But there was one significant issue with this, um, and it's one that you really think the Pepsi executives would have foreseen before trying to break into the Soviet Union, and that is that Soviet rubles were absolutely bloody worthless internationally. They couldn't exactly bring them back to the US and exchange them. For a start, it was prohibited by Soviet law 
to take the currency abroad. So a deal was worked out. As payment for the imported Pepsi into the Soviet Union, Pepsi agreed to receive Stolichnaya vodka to distribute around the US, and it worked out really well. And in fact, Stoli became extremely popular in the US. And this arrangement was all working out swimmingly until the 1980s rolled around. And the Soviet Union decided to invade Afghanistan, and that really pissed off the US. So the USA officially boycotted all Soviet products, including vodka. Which put a bit of a Soviet spanner in Pepsi's whole soft drinks for hard liquor arrangement, especially since at this point, Pepsi had become immensely popular around the Soviet Union. Russians were drinking approximately a billion servings of the stuff every year. And in 1988, Pepsi even broadcast the first paid commercials on Soviet TV, starring none other than Michael Jackson. <laughs> so Pepsi asked for a different form of payment from the USSR in exchange for their lovely dark brown liquor. And so the, the Russians, of course, turned around and went, you want some military equipment? We've got shit tons of that lying around. We've got guns and tanks galore with the Soviet Union, of course. And we're not really sure it's safe for our citizens to have so, so many explosives lying around because they keep turning up to work pissed every morning. <laughs> Anyway, in the spring of 1989, Pepsi and the Soviet Union signed a really, really strange agreement in which PepsiCo acted as a middleman to take delivery of and scrap 17 old Soviet submarines and free warships. And yes, weirdly, and now we return back to the uh, point of this odd and long tangent, this meant that technically, for that moment in history, Pepsi had the sixth largest navy and military force in the entire world. So for a while, PepsiCo was better equipped to fight a nuclear war than Zimbabwe. In fact, PepsiCo CEO Kendall joked at the time that they were disarming the Soviet Union faster than the US government. And what he didn't note was that they were secretly infiltrating the USSR with another American weapon, good old-fashioned American obesity. Because, as a result of this agreement, they managed to double the number of Pepsi plants in the Soviet Union, and off the back of that, launch another American institution throughout the Soviet Union. Pizza Hut, Russian edition. <laughs> Because it wasn't good enough to spread diabetes, they also had to spread some coronary artery disease whilst they were at it. But unfortunately, this entire swapping cholesterol for guns arrangement had to come to an abrupt halt in 1991 when the Soviet Union broke up. Pepsi did try to survive the changes and keep the agreement intact, but now instead of dealing with one single super state, they were dealing with 15 individual countries, and it was uh, just complicating matters. And to make matters even worse, Coca-Cola were aggressively entering um, former states of the Soviet Union, and Pepsi was struggling to keep up their competitive advantage. And after only a few years, Coke had beaten out Pepsi as Russia's most popular fizzy brown mysterious secret recipe water well wasn't that interesting now it's time to take a short break and we'll be back in just a moment with two more facts fact number two Sand from different beaches has its own unique sound. So apparently researchers spend a lot of time listening to sand. Someone should probably just buy them an iTunes subscription. But in 2019, all this sand listening paid off when researchers evaluated sand from nine different locations on the coast of the Netherlands using a technique called Bard's Analysis. 
And no, unfortunately, that isn't like I imagined to get a, a line full of minstrels plucking liars to examine some sand. This bards, which is significantly less Shakespearean, actually stands for broad acoustic resonance dissolution spectroscopy. And they found that each different variety of sand, from the north coast all the way to the south coast, had its own unique sound signature. So just like west coast rappers and east coast rappers, there's a difference between north coast sand and south coast sand. So using this minstrel's technique, I mean bard's technique, the researchers were able to find a unique acoustic profile for each particle of sand from different beaches, and that sound signature is um, determined based on its particle size and shape. So just by examining the sound signature of each particle of sand, researchers found they were able to uh, narrow down exactly which beach that particle of sand comes from, which is quite astonishing. But it also means that if you're planning to do a murder, don't do it in the sand pit in your back garden. And no, I know, so your sand pit in your back garden is not unique to your back garden. However, as you might expect, this does come in very handy in forensics because you can, for example, examine the particles of sand attached to a shoe and find out exactly which beach that um, perpetrator or that perpetrator's shoes may have been on. So I guess commit all your beach-based crimes barefoot, maybe? So I'm sure right now you're sat there wondering, that's all very well, but how do you listen to a grain of sand? I mean, yes, you're quite correct. It doesn't exactly sit there singing to you, does it? Well, it, it actually does, but we'll get to that in just a moment. So the way that researchers identify these unique sound signatures is that they drop the sand particles in acid. And that breaks down the sun's carbonic chemicals. And sun particles are essentially shells of long dead sea creatures. And then using highly tuned and sensitive listening devices, researchers listen to the bubbles coming through the acid and sand mixture. And the precise way it travels through the mixture yields a unique sound frequency, which can then be used to identify from whence in the world this particle of sand comes from. This process is based on the delightfully named hot chocolate effect, which was first observed by physicist Frank Crawford. Now, Frank Crawford was partial to a bit of hot chocolate in the evening, and he found that when he added hot chocolate powder to water and he tapped the bottom of the glass, as we all do, he noted that it emitted a sound which slowly rose in pitch over time. However, as I just mentioned, you don't have to dunk it in acid or make yourself a hot chocolate for that matter to, in order to get sand to sing to you. There's a reason that singing sand appears so incessantly in many song lyrics. That's because under the right conditions, certain sand on certain beaches can sing, emit a lovely sound. when wind passes over it in just the right way. Now, not any sand will sing to you, unfortunately. The sand has to meet certain criteria. And that is, the grains have to be between 0.1 and 0.5 millimetres in diameter. It has to contain silica, and it needs to be a certain level of humidity. And when all those conditions come together and the wind blows just right, you guess a sound emitted which is close to about 450 hertz. And the sound is actually created by the compression of air as it moves between the sand particles. It's exactly the same way that Ozzy Osbourne creates his singing voice as he forces air through all those tiny grains of cocaine. So far we found roughly 35 desert locations around the world where the singing sand phenomenon takes place and it can be up to 105 decibels. But if your local beach doesn't sing, it's probably because of the dampness of the sand. Water has a huge influence on the effect. So wet sand is typically silent and doesn't sing 
because the grains stick together instead of sliding over each other and creating shear force. And it's believed this shear force is highly conducive to the creation of sound. Singing sand has been observed on 33 beaches in the British Isles, including in North Wales and in the Scottish Hebrides. And it's been found on a number of beaches along North America's Atlantic coast. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to break it to you, but when you took a midnight stroll alone on the beach that fateful evening, you weren't being seduced by mermaids. It was just a sand and the wind. Fact number three. We are running out of sand. Sand is the most consumed natural resource on the planet, besides water. Not because we're drinking it, I should add. It's most commonly used in concrete, and we're using it faster than natural erosion or weathering can replace it on our beaches and such. Every year, 50 billion tonnes of aggregate is used. That's the construction industry's term for sand and gravel. That's more than enough to blanket the entire United Kingdom. Don't get any ideas, you. But you're probably thinking, there's piss loads of sand about. There's a huge desert in Africa, and I think there's one in the Middle East too. Maybe a few of us dotted around the planet. Why can't we just get some of that? Well, you see, the problem lies with the type of sand we need to use for this aggregate and concrete. Because desert sand is fairly useless for making concrete, the grains are just all the wrong shape. Desert sand has been eroded by wind rather than water, which makes the grains too smooth, they're too perfect, to interlock together and form stable concrete. Sand grains need to have all kind of jagged angles to create the correct shear strength to bind together into a solid, impervious mass. The sand specifically needed for the construction industry is only found in the beds, banks and floodplains of rivers, as well as in lakes and, of course, on the seashore, all of which has more angular grains. The demand for this lovely sand is so intense that around the world, riverbeds and beaches are being stripped bare, and farmlands and forests are being torn up to get at these precious grains. So sand can be extremely valuable, but don't try paying your tax with it. It won't work from experience. The primary driver of this sandy crisis is breakneck urbanization. Every year there's more and more people on the planet, with an ever-growing number of them moving into cities. Especially across Asia, Africa and Latin America, cities are expanding at a greater pace than any time in human history. The number of people living in urban areas has more than quadrupled since 1950, and the UN predicts another 2.5 billion will join them in the next three decades. That's the equivalent of adding eight cities the size of New York to planet Earth every single year. Let's just hope all those new metropolises don't actually come with New Yorkers too. The planet doesn't need more sarcasm and misery. Creating the buildings to house all these people, along with the road systems to knit them together, requires a hell of a lot of sand. Now, you may have heard of Dubai. It sits on the edge of quite a large desert, and it's also keen to building really big buildings. Now, you'd think they could just take a dumper truck into the desert, pick up as much sand as they liked, and use it to make their concrete. But, no. Dubai, which sits on the edge of one of the planet's largest deserts, actually imports their sand from Australia. Yes, I know, Australia's next business venture is to sell ice to Antarctica. But sand isn't only being used for Starbucks and duplexes. Large ships dredge up millions of tons of sand from the seafloor each year, piling it up in coastal areas to create new land. Mark Twain famously said, Buy land. They're not making it anymore. 
but it looks like he was wrong. Of course, Dubai's palm tree shaped islands are worldwide famous examples of artificial land masses. But Nigeria and China have also added hundreds of miles to their shorelines and creating lots of little artificial islands in the uh, South China Sea so they can claim it's all theirs. And they're not the only ones. Around the world, thousands of square miles of artificial land have been added to the coasts of various countries. Sadly, ocean dredging has damaged coral reefs in Kenya, the Persian Gulf and Florida. It tears marine habitats to pieces, and the resulting sand plumes can affect aquatic life far from the original dig site. You think it's bad when you get sand in your arse crack. Well, imagine it being poured directly into your house and suffocating your entire family. The growing demand for high-purity silica sands, which are used to make glass and tech products, is also getting way out of control. Acres of farmland in rural Wisconsin, which happen to contain a lot of those precious sands, are being torn up. All of this has led to a black market for illegally mined sand. I have to say, though, it's pretty embarrassing if you visit the black market, wherever that is, and all you bring home is sand. What did you guess at the black market, Trevor? Oh, I got some guns, bombs, RPGs, you know, some, uh, some dodgy substances. I got some sand! Tragically, in parts of Latin America and Africa, children are being forced to work as virtual slaves in sand mines. The criminal gangs who run these operations pay off the corrupt police and government officials and quite frequently kill anyone who gets in their way. Victims of these shootings have been reported in Mexico, India, South Africa, and other places. In India, the so-called sand mafias have injured hundreds and killed dozens of people, including one journalist who was burnt alive, and at least three police officers were run over by sand trucks. That sounds like a macabre joke, but unfortunately it isn't. And of course, yes, there's such a thing as sand smuggling. In 2019, in fact, a French couple were caught with 40 kilograms of Sardinian sand in their car, and they faced up to six years in jail. Imagine that conversation in the prison cell. Oh, mon ami, what are you in jail for? Oh, ritual murder and cannibalism, you know, the likes. What about you? Sardinian sand theft. They claimed they wanted to take the sand home as a souvenir, and they didn't realise they'd committed an offence by filling 14 plastic bottles full of the stuff. Okay, that sounds a little bit more than a souvenir to me. I mean, if I was heading home back from France with 14 boxes of Bordeaux, which may or may not have actually happened, I wouldn't say it's a souvenir, I would say it's an indication of a drinking problem. Yes, just in case you were getting any ideas, it is strictly forbidden for anyone to remove Sardinia's famed white sand from the island. Yet in the three summer months of 2015 alone, as much as five tons of sand was seized at various Sardinian airports. If this goes on, they'll have to start buying more of it. Maybe they could give Australia a call. They've got plenty. And that was Random Interesting Facts. Thank you for listening, and I'd absolutely love to hear your comments and suggestions for future episodes. And also be sure to like, review, and subscribe. Please do leave a comment if you've learned something new from this episode. And if you have your very own random interesting fact that you're just bursting to share with me, then tweet it using the hashtag RIFPODCAST. That's R-I-F podcast. Each week I'll choose my favourite fact from my lovely listeners and shout it out at the end of my next episode. So remember, tweet your interesting fact using the hashtag RIFPODCAST. And thanks again for listening.